Chapter Twenty Three of The Woman in the Alcove. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. The Woman in the Alcove by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter Twenty Three The Great Mogul. Part One. Later it was all explained. Mr. Gray, looking like another man, came into the room where I was endeavoring to soothe his startled daughter and devour in secret my own joy. Taking the sweet girl in his arms, he said, with a calm ignoring of my presence at which I secretly smiled, This is the happiest moment of my existence, Helen. I feel as if I had recovered you from the brink of the grave. Me? Why, I have never been so ill as that. I know, but I have felt as if you were doomed ever since I heard, or thought I heard, in this city and under no ordinary circumstances, the peculiar cry which haunts our house on the eve of any great misfortune. I shall not apologize for my fears. You know that I have good cause for them. But to-day, only to-day, I have heard from the lips of the most errant knave I have ever known that this cry sprang from himself with intent to deceive me. He knew my weakness knew the cry. He was in Darlington Manor when Cecilia died, and wishing to startle me into dropping something which I held, made use of his ventriloquial powers. He had been a mountebank once, poor wretch, and with such effect that I have not been a happy man since, in spite of your daily improvement and continued promise of recovery. But I am happy now, relieved and joyful, and this miserable being— Would you like to hear his story? Are you strong enough for anything so tragic? He is a thief and a murderer, but he has feelings, and his life has been a curious one, and strangely interwoven with ours. Do you care to hear about it? He is the man who stole our diamond. My patient uttered a little cry. Oh, tell me, she entreated, excited, but not unhealthfully. While I was in an anguish of curiosity, I could with difficulty conceal. Mr. Gray turned with courtesy toward me, and asked if a few family details would bore me. I smiled and assured him to the contrary, at which he settled himself in the chair he liked best, and began a tale which I will permit myself to present to you complete, and from other points of view than his own. Some five years before, one of the great diamonds of the world was offered for sale in an eastern market. Mr. Gray, who stopped at no expense in the gratification of his taste in this direction, immediately sent his agent to Egypt to examine this stone. If the agent discovered it to be all that was claimed for it, and within the reach of a wealthy commoner's purse, he was to buy it. Upon inspection it was found to be all that was claimed, with one exception. In the center of one of the facets was a flaw, but as this was considered to mark the diamond, and rather add to than detract from its value as a traditional stone with many historical associations, it was finally purchased by Mr. Gray and placed among his treasures in his manor house in Kent. Never a suspicious man, he took delight in exhibiting this acquisition to such of his friends and acquaintances as were likely to feel any interest in it, and it was not an uncommon thing for him to allow it to pass from hand to hand while he pottered over his other treasures and displayed this and that to such as had no eyes for the diamond. It was after one such occasion that he found, on taking the stone in his hand to replace it in the safe he had built for it in one of his cabinets, that it did not strike his eye with its usual force and brilliancy, and on examining it closely he discovered the absence of the tell-tale flaw. Struck with dismay, he submitted it to a still more rigid inspection, when he found that what he held was not even a diamond, but a worthless bit of glass, which had been substituted by some cunning knave for his invaluable gem. For the moment his humiliation almost equaled his sense of loss. He had been so often warned of the danger he ran in letting so priceless an object pass around under all eyes but his own. His wife and friends had prophesied some such loss as this, not once, but many times, and he had always laughed at their fears, saying that he knew his friends, and there was not a scamp amongst them. But now he saw it proved that even the intuition of a man well versed in human nature is not always infallible and ashamed of his past laxness, and more ashamed yet of the doubts which this experience called up in regard to all his friends, he shut up the false stone with his usual care, and buried his loss in his own bosom, till he could sift his impressions and recall with some degree of probability the circumstances under which this exchange could have been made. 
It had not been made that evening. Of this he was positive. The only persons present on this occasion were friends of such standing and repute that suspicion in their regard was simply monstrous. When and to whom, then, had he shown the diamond last? Alas, it had been a long month since he had shown the jewel. Cecilia, his youngest daughter, had died in the interim, therefore his mind had not been on jewels. A month! Time for his precious diamond to have been carried back to the east, time for it to have been recut. Surely it was lost to him forever, unless he could immediately locate the person who had robbed him of it. But this promised difficulties. He could not remember just what persons he had entertained on that special day in his little hall of cabinets, and when he did succeed in getting a list of them from his butler, he was by no means sure that it included the full number of his guests. His own memory was execrable, and in short, he had but few facts to offer to the discreet agent sit up from Scotland Yard one morning to hear his complaint and act secretly in his interests. He could give him carte blanche to carry on his inquiries in the diamond market, but little else and while this seemed to satisfy the agent, it did not lead to any gratifying result to himself, and he had thoroughly made up his mind to swallow his loss and say nothing about it, when one day a young cousin of his, living in great style in an adjoining county, informed him that in some mysterious way he had lost from his collection of arms a unique and highly prized stiletto of Italian workmanship. Startled by this coincidence, Mr. Gray ventured upon a question or two, which led to his cousin's confiding to him the fact that this article had disappeared after a large supper given by him to a number of friends and gentlemen from London. This piece of knowledge, still further coinciding with his own experience, caused Mr. Gray to ask for a list of his guests, in the hope of finding among them one who had been in his own house. His cousin, quite unsuspicious of the motives underlying this request, hastened to write out this list and together they pored over the names, crossing out such as were absolutely above suspicion. When they had reached the end of the list, but two names remained uncrossed. One was that of a rattle-pated youth, who had come in the wake of a highly reputed connection of theirs, and the other that of an American tourist who gave all the evidences of great wealth and had presented letters to leading men in London which had ensured him attentions not usually accorded to foreigners. This man's name was Fairbrother, and the moment Mr. Gray heard it, he recalled the fact that an American with a peculiar name, but with a reputation for wealth, had been among his guests on the suspected evening. Hiding the effect produced upon him by this discovery, he placed his finger on this name, and begged his cousin to look up its owner's antecedents and present reputation in America. But, not content with this, he sent his own agent over to New York, whither, as he soon learned, this gentleman had returned. The result was an apparent vindication of the suspected American. He was found to be a well-known citizen of the great metropolis, moving in the highest circles, and with a reputation for wealth won by an extraordinary business instinct. To be sure, he had not always enjoyed these distinctions. Like many another self-made man, he had risen from a menial position in a western mining camp to be the owner of a mine himself, and so up through the various graduations of a successful life to a position among the foremost businessmen of New York. In all these changes he had maintained a name for honest, if not generous, dealing. He lived in great style, had married, and was known to have but one extravagant fancy. This was for the unique and curious in art, a taste which, if report spoke true, cost him many thousands each year. This last was the only clause in the report which pointed in any way toward this man being the possible abstractor of the great mogul, as Mr. Gray's famous diamond was called, and the latter was too just a man and too much of a fancier in this line himself to let a fact of this kind weigh against the favorable nature of the rest. So he recalled his agent, double-locked his cabinets, and continued to confine his display of valuables to articles which did not suggest jewels. Thus three years passed, when one day he heard mention made of a wonderful diamond which had been seen in New York. From its description he gathered that it must be the one surreptitiously abstracted from his cabinet, and when, after some careful inquiries, he learned that the name of its possessor was Fairbrother, he awoke to his old suspicions and determined to probe this matter to the bottom, but secretly. He still had too much consideration to attack a man in high position without full proof.
Knowing of no one he could trust with so delicate an inquiry as this had now become, he decided to undertake it himself, and for this purpose embraced the first opportunity to cross the water. He took his daughter with him because he had resolved never to let his one remaining child out of his sight, but she knew nothing of his plans or reason for travel. No one did. Indeed, only his lawyer and the police were aware of the loss of his diamond. His first surprise on landing was to learn that Mr. Fairbrother, of whose marriage he had heard, had quarrelled with his wife, and that, in the separation which had occurred, the diamond had fallen to her share, and was consequently in her possession at the present moment. This changed matters, and Mr. Gray's only thought now was to surprise her with the diamond on her person, and by one glance assure himself that it was indeed the great mogul. Since Mrs. Fairbrother was reported to be a beautiful woman and a great society belle, he saw no reason why he should not meet her publicly, and that very soon. He therefore accepted invitations and attended theatres and balls, though his daughter had suffered from her voyage and was not able to accompany him. But alas, he soon learned that Mrs. Fairbrother was never seen with her diamond, and one evening, after an introduction at the opera, that she never talked about it. So there he was, balked on the very threshold of his enterprise, and recognizing the fact, was preparing to take his now seriously ailing daughter south, when he received an invitation to a ball of such a select character that he decided to remain for it, in the hope that Mrs. Fairbrother would be tempted to put on all her splendor for so magnificent a function, and thus gratify him with a sight of his own diamond. During the days that intervened, he saw her several times, and very soon decided that, in spite of her reticence in regard to this gem, she was not sufficiently in her husband's confidence to know the secret of its real ownership. This encouraged him to attempt piquing her into wearing the diamond on this occasion. He talked of precious stones, and finally of his own, declaring that he had a connoisseur's eye for a fine diamond, but had seen none as yet in America to compete with a specimen or two he had in his own cabinets. Her eye flashed at this, and though she said nothing, he felt sure that her presence at Mr. Ramsdale's house would be enlivened by her great jewel. So much for Mr. Gray's attitude in this matter up to the night of the ball. It is interesting enough, but that of Abner Fairbrother is more interesting still, and much more serious. His was indeed the hand which had abstracted the diamond from Mr. Gray's collection. Under ordinary conditions he was an honest man. He prized his good name, and would not willingly risk it but he had little real conscience, and once his passions were aroused, nothing short of the object desired would content him. At once forceful and subtle, he had at his command infinite resources which his wandering and eventful life had heightened almost to the point of genius. He saw this stone, and at once felt an inordinate desire to possess it. He had coveted other men's treasures before, but not as he coveted this. What had been longing in other cases was mania in this. There was a woman in America whom he loved. She was beautiful, and she was splendor-loving. To see her with this glory on her breast would be worth almost any risk which his imagination could picture at the moment. Before the diamond had left his hand, he had made up his mind to have it for his own. He knew that it could not be bought, so he set about obtaining it by an act he did not hesitate to acknowledge to himself as criminal. But he did not act without precautions. Having a keen eye and a proper sense or size and color, he carried away from his first view of it a true image of the stone. And when he was next admitted to Mr. Gray's cabinet room, he had provided the means for deceiving the owner whose character he had sounded. He might have failed in his daring attempt, if he had not been favored by a circumstance no one could have foreseen. A daughter of the house, Cecilia by name, lay critically ill at the time and Mr. Gray's attention was more or less distracted. Still the probabilities are that he would have noticed something amiss with the stone when he came to restore it to its place, if, just as he took it in his hand, there had not risen in the air outside a weird and wailing cry, which at once seized upon the imagination of the dozen gentlemen present, and so nearly prostrated their host, that he thrust the box he held unopened into the safe, and fell upon his knees a totally unnerved man, crying, the banshee! The banshee! My daughter will die! Another hand than his locked the safe and dropped the key into the distracted father's pocket. Thus, a superhuman daring conjoined with a special intervention of fate had made the enterprise a successful one, 
and Fairbrother, believing more than ever in his star, carried this invaluable jewel back with him to New York. The stiletto, well, the taking of that was a folly, for which he had never ceased to blush. He had not stolen it, he would not steal so inconsiderable an object. He had merely put it in his pocket when he saw it forgotten, passed over, given to him, as it were. That the risk, contrary to that involved in the taking of the diamond, was far in excess of the gratification obtained, he realized almost immediately. But, having made the break and acquired the curio, he spared himself all further thought or the consequences, and presently resumed his old life in New York, none the worse, to all appearances, for these escapades from virtue and his usual course of fair and open dealing but he was soon the worse from jealousy of the wife which his new possession had possibly won for him. She had answered all his expectations as mistress of his home and the exponent of his wealth, and for a year, nay, for two, he had been perfectly happy. Indeed, he had been more than that. He had been triumphant, especially on that memorable evening when, after a cautious delay of months, he had dared to pin that unapproachable sparkler to her breast, and present her thus bedecked to the smart set, her whom his talents, and especially his far-reaching business talents, had made his own. Recalling the old days of barter and sale across the pine counter in Colorado, he felt that his star rode high, and for a time was satisfied with his wife's magnificence and the prestige she gave his establishment. But pride is not all, even to a man of his daring ambition. Gradually he began to realize, first, that she was indifferent to him, next, that she despised him, and lastly, that she hated him. She had dozens at her feet, any of whom was more agreeable to her than her own husband, and though he could not put his finger on any definite fault, he soon wearied of a beauty that only glowed for others, and made up his mind to part with her rather than let his heart be eaten out by unappeasable longing for what his own good sense told him would never be his. Yet being naturally generous, he was satisfied with the separation, and finding it impossible to think of her as other than extravagantly fed, waited on, and clothed, he allowed her a good share of his fortune with the one proviso, that she should not disgrace him. But the diamond she stole, or rather carried off, in her naturally high-handed manner, with the rest of her jewels. He had never given it to her. She knew the value he set on it, but not how he came by it and would have worn it quite freely if he had not very soon given her to understand that the pleasure of doing so ceased when she left his house. As she could not be seen with it without occasioning public remark, she was forced, though much against her will, to heed his wishes, and enjoy its brilliancy in private. But once when he was out of town she dared to appear with this fortune on her breast, and again while on a visit west, and her husband heard of it. Mr. Fairbrother had had the jewel set to suit him, not in Florence, as Sears had said, but by a skillful workman he had picked up in great poverty in a remote corner of Williamsburg. Always in dread of some complication, he had provided himself with a second facsimile in paste, this time of an astonishing brightness, and this facsimile he had had set precisely like the true stone. Then he gave the workman a thousand dollars and sent him back to Switzerland. This imitation in paste he showed nobody, but he kept it always in his pocket, why he hardly knew. Meantime he had one confidant, not of his crime, but of his sentiments toward his wife, and the determination he had secretly made to proceed to extremities if she continued to disobey him. This was a man of his own age or older, who had known him in his early days and had followed all his fortunes. He had been the master of Fairbrother then, but he was his servant now, and as devoted to his interests as if they were his own, which in a way they were. For eighteen years he had stood at the latter's right hand, satisfied to look no further, but for the last three his glances had strayed a foot or two beyond his master and taken in his master's wife. The feelings which this man had for Mrs. Fairbrother were peculiar. She was a mere adjunct to her great lord, but she was a very gorgeous one, and, while he could not imagine himself doing anything to thwart him whose bread he ate, and to whose rise he had himself contributed, yet if he could remain true to him without injuring her, he would account himself happy. The day came when he had to decide between them, and against all chances, against his own preconceived notion of what he would do under these circumstances, he chose to consider her. 
This day came when, in the midst of growing complacency and an intense interest in some new scheme which demanded all his powers, Abner Fairbrother learned from the papers that Mr. Gray, of English parliamentary fame, had arrived in New York on an indefinite visit. As no cause was assigned for the visit beyond a natural desire on the part of this eminent statesman to see this great country, Mr. Fairbrother's fears reach a sudden climax, and he saw himself ruined, and forever disgraced if the diamond now so unhappily out of his hands should fall under the eyes of its owner, whose seeming quiet under its loss had not for a moment deceived him. Waiting only long enough to make sure that the distinguished foreigner was likely to accept social attentions, and so, in all probability, would be brought in contact with Mrs. Fairbrother, he sent her by his devoted servant a peremptory message, in which he demanded back his diamond, and, upon her refusing to heed this, followed it up by another, in which he expressly stated that if she took it out of the safe deposit in which he had been told she was wise enough to keep it, or wore it so much as once during the next three months, she would pay for her presumption with her life. This was no idle threat though she chose to regard it as such, laughing in the old servant's face and declaring that she would run the risk if the notion seized her. But the notion did not seem to seize her at once, and her husband was beginning to take heart when he heard of the great ball about to be given by the Ramsdales, and realized that if she were going to be tempted to wear the diamond at all, it would be at this brilliant function given in honor of the one man he had most cause to fear in the whole world. Sears, seeing the emotion he was under, watched him closely. They had both been on the point of starting for New Mexico to visit a mine in which Mr. Fairbrother was interested, and he waited with inconceivable anxiety to see if his master would change his plans. It was while he was in this condition of mind that he was seen to shake his fist at Mrs. Fairbrother's passing figure, a menace naturally interpreted as directed against her but which, if we know the man, was rather the expression of his anger against the husband who could rebuke and threaten so beautiful a creature. Meanwhile Mr. Fairbrother's preparations went on, and three weeks before the ball they started. Mr. Fairbrother had business in Chicago and business in Denver. It was two weeks and more before he reached La Junta. Sears counted the days. At La Junta they had a long conversation, or rather Mr. Fairbrother talked and Sears listened, the sum of what he said was this. He had made up his mind to have back his diamond. He was going to New York to get it. He was going alone, and as he wished no one to know that he had gone, or that his plans had been in any way interrupted, the other was to continue on to El Moro, and passing himself off as Fairbrother, hire a room at the hotel and shut himself up in it for ten days, on any plea his ingenuity might suggest. If at the end of that time Fairbrother should rejoin him, well and good they would go on together to Santa Fe. But if for any reason the former should delay his return, then Sears was to exercise his own judgment as to the length of time he should retain his borrowed personality, also as to the advisability of pushing on to the mine and entering on the work there, as had been planned between them. Sears knew what all this meant. He understood what was in his master's mind as well as if he had been taken into his full confidence, and openly accepted his part of the business with seeming alacrity even to the point of supplying Fairbrother with suitable references as to the ability of one James Wellgood to fill a waiter's place at fashionable functions. It was not the first he had given him. Seventeen years before he had written the same, minus the last phrase. That was when he was the master and Fairbrother the man. But he did not mean to play the part laid out for him, for all his apparent acquiescence. He began by following the other's instructions. He exchanged clothes with him and other necessaries, and took the train for La Junta at or near the time that Fairbrother started east. But once at El Moro, once registered there as Abner Fairbrother from New York, he took a different course from the one laid out for him, a course which finally brought him into his master's wake and landed him at the same hour in New York. This is what he did. Instead of shutting himself up in his room, he expressed an immediate desire to visit some neighboring mines, and procuring a good horse, started off at the first available moment. He rode north, lost himself in the mountains, and wandered till he found a guide intelligent enough to lead himself to his plans. To this guide he confided his horse for the few days he intended to be gone, paying him well and promising him additional money if, during his absence, he succeeded in circulating the report that he, Abner Fairbrother, 
had gone deep into the mountains bound for such and such a camp. Having thus provided an alibi not only for himself but for his master too, in case he should need it, he took the direct road to the nearest railway station and started on his long ride east. He did not expect to overtake the man he had been personating, but fortune was kinder than is usual in such cases, and owing to a delay caused by some accident to a freight train, he arrived in Chicago within a couple of hours of Mr. Fairbrother, and started out of that city on the same train, but not on the same car. Sears had caught a glimpse of Fairbrother on the platform, and was careful to keep out of his sight. This was easy enough. He bought a compartment in the sleeper, and stayed in it till they arrived at the Grand Central Station. Then he hastened out, and fortune favoring him with another glimpse of the man in whose movements he was so interested, followed him into the streets. End of chapter 23, part 1 Recording by Patty Cunningham